Hey guys, um, you may notice I'm in a weird setting. Um, I'm on my lunch break and I'm at work, so I am going to be filming my birth story at work. Um, but I figured this is a great time to do it because I'm on my lunch break, I'm done eating, there's no kids yelling, we're going to do it at work. So, anyway, um... This is a long-awaited video because Willa's birth was insane, like literally insane, and um, it took me a while to like process and just, it was crazy. So I am going to start a couple days before Willa was born um, on May 18th, which was a Monday, and Willa was born on Thursday, May 21st. So. Um, Previously, at my ultrasounds, the doctors told me I had polyhydramnios, which is like an extra buildup of amniotic fluid um, that's just way too much, basically. Um, you can have kind of normal polyhydramnios or severe polyhydramnios, and mine was, um, it was like not too bad, and then... Um, it was a little bit better at my next ultrasound, and then when I went back on May 18th, my polyhydramnios was severe. Um, so, the doc, the, they did everything they needed to do. I got to see the baby on the ultrasound. I had a C-section lined up for a week and a week and a half. Um, I was exactly. I think I was 37 weeks and two or three days at, uh, yeah, I was 37 weeks and three, four days, no, 37 weeks and two days at this ultrasound because she was born 37 weeks and six days. Um, so I was 37 weeks and two days at the ultrasound and I was scheduled for a C-section at 37 or no, 39 weeks. Um, and I had the C-section scheduled because the baby was breached transverse, which means she was literally laying like this. Her um, butt and back were down here in my pelvic area, and her head was up here, and her feet were over here. So she was completely sideways. Um, and obviously she can't come out that way because I wanted a VBAC. So we had the C-section scheduled um, just in case she did not turn by then because um, they didn't want me to go over 39 weeks. So we had it scheduled just in case she didn't turn, but if she turned, I was still going to try to go VBAC. So anyway, I uh, get to this appointment and they do everything they're supposed to do. They check everything out. She's still transverse. The ultrasound tech goes out, talks to the doctor. The doctor comes in. She sits down and she says, So, your polyhydramnios is way worse at this time. She said, It's almost double the amount of fluid that it was at your last ultrasound. And she said, so when they were saying that you have a C-section scheduled for next week or, or yeah, next week. And I said, no, it's the following week because the next week would have meant I was 38 weeks. Um, and she goes, I think this baby should be born way sooner than that. She goes, like, really soon. And I'm just like thinking in my head, like, okay. <laughs> um, I did not expect to hear this today. And she goes on and asks me if I'm breathing okay. And I say, yeah, you know, she goes, is it hard to breathe? And I said, well, like, not more than than normal for, like, a pregnant woman, I don't think. And um, so she's asking me all these questions. And she says, well, I want you to deliver at this hospital, which is connected it's like the same hospital as where the NICU is. We have this huge hospital here in Ohio, and it's literally like one hospital, one building, but like four or five different 
hospitals in the building. So basically, she wanted me to deliver at um, a women's hospital, which is right next to the baby's hospital, so that the baby wouldn't get separated if something was wrong. Because of the polyhydraminose, their suspicions were that the baby was not swallowing right, that she might have a blockage in her stomach, and so that's why the fluid had built up the way it did. Um, so, she wanted me to deliver at this hospital because that way if they wanted to take the baby for tests or if the baby ended up needing NICU, she would be right there down the hall. Um, so, of course, I agreed to that because I don't want to get separated from her. Um, and the hospital I was supposed to deliver at is a good 40 minutes from the hospital with the NICU. So, um, I was okay with that because it's the same hospital system, meaning, like, I don't know how everybody's hospitals work, but for us, there's, like, a brand, basically, to say, of a hospital, and then there's different ones. So it's the same system, just a different building. Um, and I was a little bit upset because my kid, both my other kids were born at the other hospital that I was supposed to have her at, and I knew what was going to happen. And, you know, generally C-sections are pretty similar at every hospital, but I was comfortable, you know what I mean? So I was a little nervous about that, but I was so ready to have her because at this point I was really miserable. Um, and I thought I was just being maybe like a little bit dramatic. Like I knew I had the extra fluid, but I figured, uh, you know, maybe it's just harder this time. And maybe I'm just uh, having a harder time because it's been a while since I was pregnant, but that was not the case, and we'll get into that. So anyway, I was extremely miserable by this point, so I just wanted to have her, and, and she was far enough along that she shouldn't have had any issues, and so I was like, okay, let's do it. So she had scheduled me for the 22nd, and then on Tuesday, my last day of work, the scheduler calls me and says, hey, we have an opening on Thursday morning, so we want you to come in on Thursday and have the C-section because they really want you to deliver as soon as possible. So I'm like, okay. So I was supposed to be at the hospital at six. This hospital is, I think I was supposed to be there at six or may, it might have been five, but I think it was five o'clock. And this hospital is an hour and a half away. So yeah, anyway, <laughs> um, so I said, okay, you know, what, what am I gonna say? Um, and then, my last day of work was Tuesday, and then Wednesday we just kind of spent the day, like, you know, preparing things, making sure the house was really clean, like, I cleaned all day, and then we, my husband mowed the lawn, he made, he grilled dinner for us, because, like, every time I'm about to have a baby, it's been scheduled, because Carmen was an induction and RJ was a C-section, and so he always makes me dinner the night before. So we had dinner and everything, um, didn't get to bed till midnight, okay? And I had to be up by, I think I had to get up by three. Um, we didn't go to bed till, uh, we laid down at midnight. I didn't fall asleep till one o'clock. And I woke up at 2.30 and could not fall back asleep. So I got an hour and a half of sleep the night before while I was born. So, we get up, we get to the hospital, um, we go back, um, we have to wait for a little bit by, like, the check-in station, so they screened us and everything when we walked in for COVID, and then we waited in the waiting room for a little bit, and then they took me back to my room, and, um, I got in my gown, and they gave me um, a COVID test, and this was all probably around 6 o'clock in the morning, um, 6 to 7. So I got my COVID test, um, they had me put a gown on, they hooked baby up to make sure she was doing good. Um, it was kind of hard to keep her on there because with all the fluid it makes things really echoey and she could just still like move like crazy with all the fluid. So it was kind of hard to keep her on there. So I had, uh, they wanted to see like what she looked like for I think 
20 minutes straight and it was really hard to even get the 20 minutes straight it took about an hour for them to get her to stay on there for 20 minutes so um my COVID test came back and it was negative and they started me on some fluids um they started an iv and all that fun stuff um they shaved me down there because they do that when you have a c-section to keep everything really sterile um and we were supposed to have the c-section at eight o'clock i believe and it might even have been seven i think it was seven or eight was like supposed to be the c-section um but there were a couple babies that were born emergently, so I had to wait because obviously the baby was doing good and I was doing good, so they um, did the emergencies first. And then I finally was taken back to the OR around 9 a.m. Um, Rex was there during this whole process. The fathers are still allowed at the hospitals in Ohio, and he was even allowed to come and go to the hospital. Like, he could go home, come back, and like, go get something to eat and come back so there was no issue there but when you have a c-section the husband cannot go back with you for the um spinal so I, they took me back for the spinal and the spinal felt like it took forever like when i had rj it was like stick 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 done like i was it was so quick and this was at my other hospital and it's kind of weird because you think that these people see, uh, I know they see way more people, so I'm not sure what the problem was because they, I think they just had a hard time placing it um, because they kept like moving the needle and asking me if I felt it in this foot and felt it in that foot and my foot would like twitch um, and it, it would get like a really sharp pain down and they'd ask me if I felt the pain. So it was like, I think they were having problems placing it because it was really painful like very painful and it took a long time and that's my worst part with the c-section it's just like if I get through this I'll be okay because once you can't feel it's usually not that bad and I knew that once that was over that I'd be all right so that finally got done they probably brought Rex in I'd say around 940 maybe 945 so he comes in and um, during the c-section I felt a lot more than I did with RJ. With RJ, I really didn't feel much at all. I kind of felt some like tapping, which was actually them moving everything around, but to me it just felt like somebody was like tapping on my stomach. Um, with her, I felt not really pain, but I felt all the pressure. Like I could tell pretty much what they were doing, it just didn't hurt. Um, so I guess. According to the anesthesiologist there, that's how it's supposed to feel. You're supposed to be able to feel the pressure. They said that my last hospital probably gave me too much. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but yeah. I was way happier with my C-section with RJ. It was less painful, it was quicker, and just the whole experience was overall better. Um, my Although my anesthesiologist, I had two of them. But there was like a lead one who like kind of controlled more of the stuff and then there was one that stayed by me. And the one that stayed by me, um, the, w the one that was the lead one was a male and he was really nice too. But the one that stayed right by my head, she was a, a female and she was really comforting and really nice. Um, so I did like the anesthesiologist more at this hospital because my last one, he didn't really even talk to me much at all. Um, so she was like asking me questions and things to keep me distracted during it. Um, and then at 10.23 a.m. Willa was born. Um, I had asked them before to lift her over the curtain as long as she was okay so that I could see her and they said they always do that as long as the baby's good. So they had the pediatricians in there because of all the fluid they wanted to make sure that something wasn't emergently wrong with her. Um, so they pulled her out, um, she said, oh, she came out, she came out butt first, she's so cute, because she was sideways, so they pulled her out sort of by her button legs, um, and she didn't cry right away, and they didn't, um, lift her up over the curtain, 
Um, so immediately I kind of caught on that something wasn't right because they didn't lift her up over the curtain. And it took me, I it was like pretty, I felt like I was holding my breath when I couldn't hear her crying because I was like, okay, okay, okay. And it was probably, probably not even a whole minute before she started crying. It was probably like 30 seconds, but when you're in an OR and everything's quiet and this baby just came out and you're expecting to hear this big cry and nothing's coming out, it seems like time is literally moving in slow motion. So finally, probably I'd say about 50 seconds, 30 to 50 seconds later, she let out a little cry and she kept letting out little cries and she was crying. And so I assumed nothing was really going to be wrong. They were just looking at her because of all the issues and she didn't cry right away. So that's why they handed her to the pediatricians. So I didn't really think anything was really wrong because we heard her crying. So to me, that was just like relief. Like she's good. We're good. So um, time just keeps going on and on. And I can tell they're over there kind of like there's several doctors over her and they're all just kind of doing things and you couldn't really see, see what was going on. And my husband kept asking the anesthesiologist, like, what's going on? Is she okay? And, and she's like, yeah, she looks good. Like, they wouldn't really tell us what was happening. And that's the most aggravating part of the whole thing was in the OR, no one would actually tell us what was going on with the baby. They wouldn't let Rex go over there to see her. They wouldn't actually tell us, look, she's having some issues breathing. We think this or that. They just didn't say anything. They just kept saying, oh, she looks good. She looks good, you know. And, you know, it was like a communication error because obviously the anesthesiologist doesn't know for sure what's going on. The doctors are sewing me up, so they're busy with me. And the baby is over on the other side of the OR getting worked on. And so they're not talking to us. So it was very frustrating. I'm still a little mad that they didn't like have one of the pediatricians real quick say something to us so we kind of knew what was going on. So anyway, they worked on her for a while, probably a good 15 minutes. And then, and then a pediatrician came over once they're already getting her into an incubator and everything and says, okay, so baby has to go to NICU and immediately I just started bawling. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. Like, I just figured if I made it to 37 weeks, I was almost 38 weeks, I thought for sure she was gonna be okay. Cause they basically said that there could be a problem. That's why we want you to go to this hospital, but there's probably not a problem. So that gave me a lot of comfort. Like it's probably just gonna be a normal birth. They're probably just gonna run some tests on her when she's born and everything's gonna be fine. And I really tried to breathe that into myself and to my mind so I wouldn't be so worried and then it happened anyway so it was like just this big breakdown moment like you have to be kidding me I've been telling myself all week that she's going to be okay and I don't have to worry and everything's going to be all right and that it could be something real simple and let's just calm down and then boom she has to go to the NICU so it was just like really hard and I'm like bawling and the anesthesiologist is like look you need to calm down because you you freaking out is not best for her and you so just calm down and take some deep breaths and finally I did calm down so um they brought the baby over before they took her um they she was in the incubator and the pediatrician thankfully she was doing good enough that the pediatrician brought her out and put her by my head so I was able to actually touch her for a minute and like talk to her and see her and then they put her back and they went to the NICU. Um, I wanted Rex to go right away, but they said that they they wanted um, her to have time to get set up. So he had to wait. And looking back, I probably would have pushed it more because I feel like he should have been able to go with her. And if we would have insisted, they would have had to because we're the parents. <laughs> But I was like, you know what, just, he, I need him here right now anyway, and yeah, so anyway, they're sewing me up and everything, and it felt like it took like a really, really, really long time for them to sew me up. So anyway, I think we left the OR around 11.45, so it did take a little over an hour for them to get everything back together and everything. Um, but they did also send my placenta to pathology so that maybe have been 
played a part in it. I didn't know that until they were wheeling me out of the OR that they had sent that to pathology to kind of figure out why this polyhydramulose thing was going on. So they left. We left the OR around 11.45. Um, they took me back to the room I was in for probably about two hours. Rex went down after the hour was up to see the baby. He brought um, me some pictures and so I um, was able to see her sort of and he um, FaceTimed me while I was down there and she had a CPAP because she was having trouble keeping her oxygen level high enough. It wasn't horrible but it wasn't where they want to see it. She was like in the 70s and they want it in the 90s. So obviously that's low. So she was on a CPAP and she was keeping her oxygen in the 80s with that. Um, and she was on an IV for fluids and she wasn't eating yet because she had the CPAP. They don't want the babies to try to eat and have the CPAP at the same time because obviously she's already working hard to breathe. And she was having some um, respirations, meaning she was breathing fast. Um, so that's why she was in the NICU because she couldn't breathe right. So he went down to see her. Um, and then about two hours after my c-section i would say they took me to a smaller room which i was kind of like are you serious because this is a huge hospital and it was like a tiny room like the size of a closet like it was literally probably i'd say 10 feet by 10 feet like it was really small and I had a bathroom and everything but it was like just literally a closet like my bed was like right next to the chair that I slept in so it was a really tiny room and I was like gotta be kidding because I figured I was gonna get this nice room because the room they had me in first was really nice and I was like oh you know but since I didn't have the baby with me and my baby was in the NICU they put me in this room because they didn't need as much room as they would with if the baby was in there with you and the room was literally right at the end of the hall where it connects to the NICU. So I wasn't like right next to the NICU, but I was at the end of the hall and then you go through the door and you go down one more hall and the NICU is right there. So they put me as close to the NICU as I could. So once I found that out, I was like, oh, okay, like they were doing me a solid, like, like I don't have to walk that far to go see her. Because I was like, you got to be kidding me. This room is like tiny. So, again, it was something stupid, not that big of a deal, like, but I was just like, this is like one of the best hospitals in our state. Like, I was just like shocked that the room was so tiny. But then once, once I found out she was right down the hall, it was good. I was like, okay, cool. Um, so then around 4.30, I would finally, um, they took me out of the bed and helped me get in a wheelchair. Um, so that was the first time I got up, and it hurt. It did hurt a lot, but um, when I had gotten up with RJ, I literally almost passed out, and I didn't have any of that this time. And I don't know if it's because they sat me down in a, a wheelchair right after, or if it was just because it was a different C-section and I healed differently. I don't know. But um, I think part of it, too, was that they had me sit in the bed for a long time after RJ. Like, I was in bed for 27 hours after RJ C-section. So I feel like maybe when I got up, all the blood kind of rushed to my head and it made me feel like I was going to pass out. Because with her, I had none of that. And I only waited five hours, six hours after my C-section to get up. So I got up, got in the wheelchair. They wheeled me down to see Willa and she was just in the little incubator. And I remember feeling so sad, though, that she was in there because she was just, like, limp and, like, just looked exhausted. And come to find out that that's why they think she was um, having trouble breathing is she was just exhausted because she, obviously, one, wasn't, like, ready. It was a couple weeks early as she was full t considered full term, but she was early. And also just... Um, they said she was just in shock, sort of, because she wasn't, like, expecting it, basically. Because kind of when they turn and get down in there, they kind of, they must kind of understand what's happening or, like, just prepare themselves, and she wasn't basically prepared. So, she was just kind of in shock, 
And if you know Willa now, if you knew Willa now, that's her personality. Like, if she don't want to do something, she don't want to do it. Like, and if something makes her mad, she, she will think about it forever. Like, she will just cry and cry and cry if something upsets her. So she's just that way. And so when she was born, she was probably like, dude, I don't want, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be here. Um, so anyway, she was, ended up being that she was in shock. But during this time, they didn't know why she couldn't breathe because she was full term, she should have been able to breathe. Um, and her tone was really low, meaning her muscles were very limp. And she wasn't showing, she had her reflexes, but she wasn't showing strength in her muscles. So they were worried that she had some sort of brain damage, which just pulled me into a whole nother whirlwind of, oh my gosh, like what is wrong with my baby? Like, does she have some kind of birth injury? What's going on? And all the doctors were like, we're really sorry. We can't give you answers right now. Like we're trying to figure out what's wrong with her. And me and Rex are like, but like, what's going on? Like, we want to know what's going on. And they're like, well, you know, being reasonable, but to us, it's our child. And like, everything was already so like confusing. Like, why did I have the polyhydramidose? Why was she, why was she transverse breach? Like all of these things. And then just for her to be born and still have all these other unanswered questions it was like a lot mentally so anyway um I don't remember a whole lot of the rest of that day I know that I went back to my room and ate dinner and ended up being able to sleep for a few hours which was good because I ended up being up for like a long time like a really long time because I only got an hour of sleep so I didn't really count that hour, and basically without that hour, I had been up for 36 hours by the time I went to bed. So I was exhausted, so I went to sleep for probably about six hours, and then or it might have been about four hours because I was pumping for the baby. So I think it was like about four hours, and I fell back asleep for a little bit, and then I went down to the NICU to see her again, and then um, that afternoon they had let me hold her. Um, and basically, she had all the tests the next day, and everything was normal. Um, she did end up having a little bit of jaundice, too, so she was put under lights for one night, and it was actually the night we went home. Sunday, I was discharged, and I came home for a night so that I could gather more things because I wasn't expecting her to be in the NICU, um, especially not for that long because I had packed for four days, and we were there for four days. So um, I had to go get more clothes and everything because I knew she could was probably going to be there for a good week at least. Um, so we went home. She had the jaundice that night. She went under her lights and it stayed low enough the whole time after that that she didn't have to go back under lights. Um, she was in the NICU for eight days. So she had been born on Thursday and she went to step down on Friday. So she was in the NICU for a week and a day. Um, and then she went to step down and I went home, I think for another night and then, um, came back and stayed with her for the rest of her stay. So we were in step down and in there, um, she was able to be, um, taken off the feeding tube. Um, she didn't nurse well, so we were bottle feeding, which but was fine because, um, it meant we could go home sooner if she was eating good and that was like my thinking like the nurses didn't push it at all They were like, okay, well, let's try nursing tomorrow. And I was just like She we tried it again. She didn't want to do it. She was screaming I'm like, I just want to give her a bottle until we get out of here and then it, I'm gonna try nursing at home, which I did so she was getting my pumped milk and so she was able to come off the feeding tube because she did have a feeding tube as well. And then a day later, she was able to, or two days later, she came off the cannula, which is her oxygen, because they had moved her to a cannula the day after she was born instead of the CPAP because she kept trying to pull the CPAP off. Um, and it was kind of stressing her out, making her oxygen dip even lower. So they put a cannula in, which is just like, um, a tube like the regular oxygen that you see on people um that's what she had and um by the time she went to step down she was only pretty much on room air she wasn't on oxygen 
Um, she was just on like an, a flow of air into her to kind of keep her lungs inflated. Um, it wasn't like an actual oxygen. She at no point needed oxygen. Um, she just had um, air blowing into her because that's what the CPAP is too. It's just air. Um, it's not oxygen. So at no point did they actually give her oxygen because her oxygen levels never dip low enough for her to ha actually have to have oxygen. Um, so she went to step down. They got her off of everything there. They weaned her off the oxygen and I, they did that on, I believe, Sunday. And they said that she had to be there for um, another 24 hours to make sure her oxygen stayed good before they could send her her home. So they said that we could go home Tuesday if she stayed good. I th Actually, I think they took her off. Yeah. So she had been there Friday. They took her off of the feeding tube Saturday. They took her off the oxygen Sunday and we went home Tuesday. Um, so she really made a ton of progress. As soon as we left the NICU, it was just like boom, 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 boom. She's good to go home. So, um, she went home on Tuesday, which I believe was, um, I think it was May 3rd or 4th that she went home. So, yeah, um, that is pretty much it for my birth story. Um, postpartum wise, um, it was a little rough. I'm not gonna lie. Like, I'm 14 weeks out and I'm still, like, adjusting. Obviously, she's only three months old and things are still very new, but, um, it was rough adjusting and I actually do have a slight case of postpartum depression. I had started medication for it, but it made my stomach really upset, so I'm no longer on that. Um, and I feel like I'm managing it well without medication. Not to say that I may not need it eventually, but right now I feel like I'm managing my PPD pretty well without it. So, um, I do have some, like, I feel like kind of birth trauma just because this whole thing was just, like, kind of thrown at us. I was expecting to still have a week and a half to get stuff ready, and I still had a week of work and all these things, and then all of a sudden she's just here and she's in the NICU and she can't breathe and we don't know why, and blah, 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 blah. So, anyway... Um, I wanted to finally film it because this was such a crazy thing. Like I said, I didn't expect it to go down like this. I thought I was going to have like this V back and only have a C-section. If absolutely, that's if something crazy happened because most of my kids, other kids turned. Like I didn't, RJ was breached for a while because I also had the polyhydraminos, but it wasn't as severe. Um, and he turned. So even though I had the C-section with him, it wasn't because he wasn't turned. It's because they thought he was going to be way bigger than he was because they didn't know that I had polyhydramidals. So, um, I just expect it to go into this, like, I'm going to have this beautiful V-back and I'm only going to have a C-section if something goes wrong. And if I do have, that was the best thing for her. Um, and yeah, so. Anyway, that was Willow's birth, and it was crazy, but um, I feel like I feel like I grew a lot from it, and um, now I kind of understand what other mothers go through, like especially preemie moms. I can't even imagine because being in the NICU for 12 days or eight days, and then then step down for 12 days or four days altogether we were there for 12 days I can't imagine being there for months because I felt like I was going crazy especially with all the COVID stuff I couldn't really have anybody there besides Rex and it was just it was some crazy times so anyway I wanted to document it and let you guys know how it happened because our birth vlog was kind of short I mean it wasn't really short but I couldn't show a whole lot during the actual c-section and everything so you guys didn't really know exactly what was going on and how everything happened so that's the full story and i hope you guys enjoyed it i am gonna go because my lunch break is over in five minutes so i have to go i hope you guys enjoyed this video and we will talk to you next time